very special ladies and today we have uh, Dr. Bharti and the professor and head of uh, department of EMT from Jesus Mental College and uh, she will speak to us about a very important topic that's uh, obstetric sleep apnea which if not properly managed, if uh, neglected, can lead to many, many complications, including sudden cardiac death and the, uh, many uh, other issues which she will probably elaborate during her talk. So I welcome you, Madam, for today's talk. I welcome uh, Dr. K. R. Kamath, sir, uh, all the senior consultants, all the Doctors and staff who have uh, come to listen to Bhakti Ma'am. And uh, I request now Rupa Ma'am to uh, give a brief introduction of this uh, speech.
opportunity to be here and to share my experience uh, about the surgical aspects, how we can, uh, in the, you know, whether surgery has any role in obstructive sleep apnea. So the debate exists for many years. Okay. See, any surgery for that matter, any uh, treatment modality, if it has to be successful, the results when they do the auditing, it has to be somewhere above 50%. But in our earlier auditing of this surgical management of the OAC, the results were less than 45. So they said surgery doesn't have any role in obstructive sleep apnea. Um, it is only the medical <coughs> management, that is the CPAP or whatever the other managements. But later, after knowing the pathophysiology and how to deal with the problems what we have in these patients, um, it has come back again. You know, it's always changing. Because the exact pathophysiology of obstructive sleep apnea is very difficult. We understand, okay, we can diagnose. Yeah, on the way Correct. But Adiyataki Gurkyo Vita Idare, why? That is a problem in understanding the pathophysiology of this broad spectrum disorder, which has uh, put all the modalities in place so that at least the patient should be benefited either of one of these modalities. So I thank once again, sir, and uh, my friend. Uh, Dr. Rupa, who invited me some four months back. And after she will listen, your daughter is getting married. I don't want you to come here. You come in the next year. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Rupa and uh, Ratna Mala, sir. And uh, Dr. Shenai, sir. And Chandra Modi, sir. Actually, Dr. Shenai is the one who, you know, he, uh, like, uh, he made me to go into the pediatric ORI. That is the pick pediatric water and laryngologist. So he inspired me, started sending cases. So like, you know, we do regularly now the pediatric water in cases also, along with the new doctor, um, Rajesh Shadi also. These are the two references, like I keep getting the difficulty airways. So like when somebody refers to you, then automatically as a doctor, you feel like you should do your service to the patient. Like that, the obstructive sleep apnea, my interest in that also grew long back. So I will be just sharing my experience with you people. And uh, Aruba told me also, see you did not address to the uh, esteemed gather who are here because they all know. But there are people who are apart from the paramedicals also. So you make them interest in the topic. So afternoon she made me know that. So I just changed a little bit my slides. No. Voice again? Yes. Okay. So these are the kids they come to us. So what happens is in the house, like it's not only uh, I'm astonished in my service of last 30 years, I've seen various, even the medical people also. Uh, okay, good cure with that, you know, Mongo Gonsal Paushan, I did it, I did it, I did it, I did it. So our knowledge, like one decade back was not, uh, and there are so many doctors who kid was suffering. And uh, just adenoid enlargement, adenoid tonsillar enlargement. And then with that, uh, they were struggling. And then after five years of struggling, like, you know, that's a sort of uh, stigma which is attached. Tonsils and adenoids we are not supposed to remove. So, but when they are causing the problem, that is not holds good. So we need to think about it. Uh, so, actually our list with the adenotonsillectomy, the only indication for adenotonsillectomy is the obstructive sleep apnea. Others are all, yes, we have conquered with antibiotics or 
with the uh, advice to the patient, counseling the patient to take care of oral hygiene, oral parental hygiene. Yes, we have contact, but the adenoid hypertrophy, the tonsillar hypertrophy causing OSA, that is the indication, we should not neglect. And this is the other who had it. OSA was in the waiting room for the surgery. In the waiting period of his dosing off and his sleeping, deep sleep you can hear him. And this is what as Rupa put across. Maybe before that they used to quarrel, the wife never used to sleep. Oh, my husband is snoring or like, you know, usually they get a complaint. But now we have this. I set your intro to the sound of snoring. So that I want you to experience what I go through each night. So that's how you teach your partner what problem you have. Yeah. <laughs> so what? Yeah, recording also. Now we ask them to record and come. <laughs> we aim it. But the thing is recording again, you need to be awake. <laughs> but the children take it. <laughs> yeah. We aim at this is the sound sleep which everyone has to go through. Even adults also should sleep like a child. It's a collaborative approach. Each branch, everyone, it's not like I treat the case. It's we should treat the respiratory medicine, maxillofacial, endocrinology, service, the uh, neurology, cardiologist, dietitian, policy makers. And this is our AV and uh, how the story and the collapse happens. So for the people who are behind that, see so the... When the air enters, there is a passage. Okay? And if this collapses partially, then you get snoring. That is, if the total collapse is like this, then we get apneic episodes. Like... <laughs> Like that, that's uh, actually you can make out. Uh, it's, there's no difficulty in identifying these patients. It's an emerging important health problem for awareness among public as well as primary health. It is everyone, whoever comes to the clinic, they come, Madam, I'm going to go to the clinic. I'm going to go to Next time, I'm going to go to the clinic. And that next time never comes again, if at all, whatever the problem, uh, if it increases, they come again. If it is at the same level, they do not come. So we need to educate our public as well as the primary health care providers and associated with co severe comorbidities, that is early onset hypertension, diabetes, then insulin resistance syndrome, coronary heart disease, then now uh, those who have uh, daytime somnolescence, like uh, uh, they will be driving and uh, or even the sitting, like morning, as soon as you get up, you should be very fresh because you would have had a good sleep. But if you are not fresh, that means your sleep is somehow insufficient. What is the cause for the sleep insufficiency? You should evaluate. This is the problem uh, we have, burden of the problem. In adults, 3.7 to 21. And uh, the incidence is 4.4 to 92.7 in males. And you know, it's predominant in males. It's a sleep disorder. This uh, uh, in simple terms, we are all breathing. If there is a temporary cessation, okay, uh, that means temporarily you stop uh, breathing. That is called as apneic episode. That is for the kids who are there behind. What is if it are permanently stops, what you call it as, then it will happen for the kids behind. Permanently, you stop breathing. Yeah. So it's a death. If you permanently, if you don't. So it is always you should put the word temporary separation of the breathing. It is the most common type of sleep disorder breathing and is characterized by recurrent episodes of upper airway collapse. So see the airway is a tube and the flow, air flow occurs in it. If it is a smooth flow, no turbulence occurs. If there is something coming in the way of this air flow, then the turbulence occurs and that turbulence is 
produce the noise produced by the turbulence is either the snoring and then complete obstruction, then the apnea, that is temporary sedation. It's a cessation of the airflow for at least only 10 seconds. Hypopnea. If the obstruction is not severe, okay, totally it's not cutting off, but little bit uh, hypopnea is there. That is like the snoring goes, goes. Then again they wake up. That is apnea. But if it is the frequent, I mean that sound reduces and again they start breathing, that is hypopnea. So what we call hypopnea is transient reduction of breathing for 10 seconds or longer, a decrease of greater than 50% in the amplitude when we record it, the amplitude of a, a validated measure of breathing or a reduction in the amplitude of less than 50% and we always do the SpO2 monitoring. So if it is 4% oxygen desaturation. Actually this is more common than the other two terminologies what I told. There are respiratory effort related arousal. So as I told you, what are the medical problems we encounter with this disorder? Like pathophysiology, we need to put like uh, always we need to understand what exactly is this. So you know we have endotypes which talks about the pathophysiological changes which goes on in the body. Then we have the phenotypes that is the disease expression, how it is expressed. So the endotypes, the pathophysiology, you have the anatomical obstruction. That is from the nose till the trachea. Either you have deviated gross, deviated nasal septum, or huge adenoids, or you have the salpingopharyngeal folds which are very prominent, or the tonsils which are great four tonsils. So, or you have the epiglottis which obstructs. Then second one is the pharyngeal dilator muscle dysfunction. That is the tone of the pharyngeal, see the pharyngeal muscles when they sleep, when there is no stimulation it should dilate. But the tone is so reduced that it will not dilate, so it will be constricted. Then we have the uh, apneic episodes. And then this third one is lower uh, arousal threshold or ventilatory, and that is we call it as a ventilator, the ventilatory do. Okay? And in these two, the uh, second and the third endotypes, we have the medical end of management, but still it is not established, but they give drugs, trial drugs and see whether it's helping them or not. But in the first, it is the surgery, which is the answer. Then the phenotypes, it is a disease expression, like either you can have cardiovascular or disturbed sleep with insomnia, all sleep related uh, changes, then symptomatic patients. So these are the sorry high risk patients, the older age males. As I told, I showed that even the prevalence as well as the incidence is more, and in pregnancy, genetic predisposition is there. Tobacco speak, uh, smoking, and in females in the menopause, after menopause, as the tone becomes reduced, so they have the more uh, incidence. And alcohol use because it reduces the tone and nighttime nasal condition, endocrine abnormalities, hyperthyroidism, and then obesity, central body fat distribution, neck circumference if it is more, and cranial facial disformity. How do we evaluate this? We take the history. Usually all these patients, we put this DSS, EPS for sleepness scale. That gives you an idea how much of sleep disturbance this patient has, like when they sitting, reading, watching TV, sitting, in all this, um, like, you know, day-to-day -day activities, how much of sleep is disturbed, so chance of dosing, then we put the scoring. And then we take this top band questionnaire, it's where it's sometimes we take, but mainly we go for ESS. And the examination, we examine the height, weight and we calculate the basal metabolic index. Next circumference is very really important. And then iomental distance, then the mouth opening. And all this top and questionnaire, snoring, tired, absurd, blood pressure, BMI, age, next circumference, gender. This is a normal uh, 
Then afterwards we examine the patient as a whole. We see because see the examination is very important in these patients. You can make out uh, like recently I had a patient who came with just uh, uh, like um, it's not exactly he said he's snoring or uh, but uh, somehow he said I have got nasal obstruction I can't breathe in the night I can't. So his voice was a little bit muffled. So you know you have to go and examine the patient as a whole. So I just asked him some history which thought, I thought maybe the way he was hypothyroidism he did not, he said nothing, nothing, I am alright. But when we sent the blood test, TSH was more than 100. So it's like that, you have to examine the patient as a whole. Because if it is hypothyroid, you treat them, they will be alright. Uh, it's like that. Yeah. Then we need to take their height, weight, BMI, then other uh, cardiovascular problems, whether it's already they will have BPV rule out. And then we examine the facial configuration of the patient, especially the retrognathia and the maxilla how it is placed, uh, so whether the profile view of the patient as well as the front view we just examine and then we ask the patient to open the mouth and then we ask the patient to keep the tongue inside and then we see the tongue position. I think anesthesia, uh, they all know about this. So the Friedman tongue position, uh, this is very important for us because this tongue position helps us to know whether the patient has got tongue beats problem. So this is the type 1, type 2, type 3 and type 4 where the entire soft palate is not seen. Where you just examine the patient, the hard palate is seen. So in this patient, you need to, like in the type 4, you need to be very careful whether the tongue crease is a problem or the redundancy of the soft palate or the hard palate is so large that the tongue appears to be at the pushed above. Then we have the staging. We combine the treatment along with the tonsillar size and then we stage them. This is all to know the anatomical abnormality, whether surgery has a role in these patients, that's all. The investigation as I told you, thyroid profile, lipid, diabetic, uh, and also we do the inflammatory markers, CRP we do, and then platelet count we do in all these patients, ECT, echo, and then Mm, X-ray cephalometry only if it is required if the patient has got the uh, retro and the, we do. Otherwise, in all patients we don't. And in the pediatric case, we did in some study we did where we uh, look for uh, usage of rapid axillary expansion. In them we did this. Dynamic MRI is the one which is very good, which gives us the 3D picture of what happens when the patient is sleeping. But the problem with this dynamic MRI is the patient has to sleep in the console at least for two hours and it's very difficult because the, whatever it is, you can't sleep one plus whatever the ear uh, phones you keep also, they will be disturbed. So how far it is feasible, it's little compliance wise, it's not uh, accepted by the patient, but uh, like uh, strictly speaking, that is the best investigation for these patients to know where is the level of obstruction. Then comes the standard uh, exam uh, investigation for these patients. See, all these changes are happening during sleep. So the snoring or the apneic episodes. So we need to know whether this snoring is physiological. I mean, in some patients, in some individuals, I don't name them as uh, patients, there will be snoring, but no pathophysiological changes has happened in them. So whether we need to put them there or we need to put them pathological. So we need to see the changes which is happening in the body during sleep. So how we should know that? So this is the standard. Uh, investigation that is polysomnography. That is, we ask the patient to get admitted in the
the previous day. And there are various levels. We have a level one, that is we monitor all this. And then we have level two, it's not good. Level three, level four, they are there which can be done either uh, at home also. If the patient wants, like I don't want to come to your hospital because I don't get sleep if I come outside. Because it should be a natural sleep so that all the changes which is happening in your body, they can record. So that is level three and level four. But level one is the best to differentiate between the uh, central sleep apnea and upset with sleep apnea. So these are the recordings which we check in all this in the polysomnography level one. EEG, EOG, EMG, ECG, third abdominal movements, air flow approximately. As well as the EMG, we keep in the submental muscle, the tone of the submental muscle also, we check for it. That is very important because that indirectly gives us an idea about the hypoglossal muscle. And then, if at all, patients with the respiratory disturbance index, we give the indices afterwards. Higher than 40 during the first few hours of diagnostic PhD should undergo split the night PhD study. That is 8 hours of sleep, first 4 hours the regular PhD you do, and next 4 hours with the CPAP, you do whether uh, the CPAP will help the patient or not, it will detect. Uh, this is the, these are the, uh, the what you call, inferences we get when we do this polysomnography. Uh, this is apnea hypopnea index. These are very important for us. Depending on that, we decide what to do for this patient. Apnea hypopnea index, then the respiratory disturbance index. It is the average number of respiratory disturbances. That is all the changes which are happening while sleeping. Whether it is obstructive or apnea, hypopnea, respiratory analysis, it records per hour. Whereas, this IHI, it records over the number of hours of sleep. So this we don't uh, uh, go for it now. So, but the main problem with polysomnography, it gives us what are the changes which is happening in the body. But it will not tell us where exactly is the obstruction, whether the nose or the palate or the tongue face or the hypopalis, and what exactly uh, we have to do. And later on the obstruction also it will not be whether it is dynamic or static obstruction. Dynamic means all this um, neuromuscular intronicity, all that comes as dynamic. Static means there is some tumor like uh, deviated nasal septum, some mass, uh, space occupied lesion, so that it will not give us. And uh, so then after the polysomnography, to know the level, like once we know that the polysomnography level 1 is very good to differentiate between central sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea. Now it has given us an idea whether it is obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea. Central sleep apnea will then refer to neurologist as well as pulmonologist to take care. Then obstructive sleep apnea, then there we come in picture. We need to know where is the level of obstruction and what sort of obstruction so that we can plan the surgery. So we drug, uh, this uh, dies what we call it as or drug induced sleep endoscopy. It's like we give some uh, like um, sedation for these patients so that they go for sleep and this sleep should mimic near normal sleep so that we know the collapse where it is up, then we do the endoscopy and see for where the obstruction is. So normally we use propofol in the bolus, the first uh, one dose we give and then the bolus we give. Or the dexmedetamine we use. But the problem is dexmedetamine is slow in action as well as slow to come out of the drug. So we need to keep the patient for long in the hospital. And uh, uh, me and Dr. Nalin, she is not here. So we all did one, uh, I think in 37 patients, uh, in, in, I think 2017 we published, because that's only for a period of one and a half years, we did dives in all our 